thank you for that wonderful introduction. Let me begin by chanting the Lord's Prayer using almost the exact words that Jesus taught his disciples. I cannot wash my dedicate this event to the saintly Palakil Toma Malpan, my collateral and sister who died in 1841. He was a great teacher of the Aramaic language and founder of the seminary in his native town and first seminary of the St. Thomas Christians and founded the first religious congregation for men in India to which I belong, the Carmelites of Mary Immaculate. So it's a great honor to be here to talk about the language that he was so passionate and he taught his disciples. Almost for a thousand years, the biggest export item from India was religion. And that religion was not Hinduism, it was Buddhism. Ever since Emperor Ashoka accepted Buddhism, he became the biggest zealous promoter, just like Constantine did to Christianity. And he sent missionaries to the different parts of the world, including Palestine and the Middle East. Emperor Ashoka not only accepted Buddhism, but he also laid out foundations for respectful dialogue and respect for other religious traditions. So, by the time Christianity came on the scene, India had already prepared that mindset to welcome anything and everything without contradicting but respect. So it is in this context, we talk about the movement of the Eastern religion, which became Christianity, to other part of Asia, to South India in Kerala. It is amazing that Christianity moved to South India before the preaching of Jesus, the charisma of Jesus became a religion. Jesus did not promote a religion. He lived a Jew, died a Jew. He changed the perception of his own mother faith, but eventually it became a religion. Before Christianity became a doctrinal religion, the faith reached Kerala. We believe it came through St. Thomas the Apostle, one of the twelve apostles. Because of the trade relationship, spice trade, the region was known to the Middle East, so probably he came in one of those ships. In any case, we received that simple faith. And interestingly, this is the man who made the biggest profession of faith in just two words in Aramaic language, Ma Wala, my Lord and my God. This was an exuberant outburst when Jesus appeared especially for him and asked him to touch his hands and touch his side. He came out with this profession of faith, Ma Wala, simple words, my Lord and my God. While the disciples were doubtful, he said, you are man and God. And it took 325 years. And the I had the Roman Emperor. I had to arrive at a, a simple, 
consensus on the exegesis of these two words which we have the Nicene Creed. You look at the Creed, how much they have been struggling to pin down what St. Thomas the Apostle said in two words. So this faith in its simplest form came to India <coughs> and it survived there and the new course they created poetry meaning they had connection with the Middle East in the Syriac Aramaic language the poetry that they were singing celebrated the faith, the simple faith. I'm going to sing two lines, a couplet, which expresses deep Christological theology. So this is part of a canonical prayer, literally the hours. And this is the 18th couplet from a long chant, sung during Advent and Christmas seasons. But when it comes to that particular couplet, the liturgical book says, sing thrice, three times because of the significance of the text. And uh, the Sira Malabar Christians <coughs> began to take it as a separate chant and sing it in three ascending pitch registers and proclaim the faith. Sagadinan ma, lala husar, walla shusar, dila hu lada. Sagadinan ma, ma the same ma wala ma. We worship you, Lord. Lala husar, alaha is God. Allah Hussar is divinity. Lala Hussar, your divinity. Look, Allah Hussar, and your Nasha is man. Nasha, <coughs> humanity. Nasha, your humanity. The, la, the next phrase is the crucial. The la ulaga. Ula is doubt or division. Very clever play on the word. La ulaga, without division or without doubt. While Christianity was struggling in several ecumenical councils to define how did humanity and divinity in Christ came together, they were breaking their heads, they were expelling the stories. <laughs> so you can imagine so many things were happening. St. Thomas Christians in India were singing this couplet which proclaimed everything was resolved. There was no problem. Sardin and Malala Husa, Walla Susa, the Lapula Sardin and Malala Husa, Walla Susa, the Lapula Sardin and There's another song that again dissolves the cloud of Nestorianism that was hanging over the St. Thomas Christians ever since the Portuguese encountered them. And that song is another traditional melody. Bar Mariam, Bar Mariam, Bar Alaha, Eldest Mariam. Son of Mary, Son of Mary. Mary gave birth to the Son of God. Theotokos is not a problem. Barmariam, Barmariam, Baralaha, Eldas Mariam. And they will sing the Rasul stanzas, and this will be the refrain. The Rasul stanzas go, Son of Mary did the Son of Mary promised the particle. Son of Mary sanctified the waters of Jordan by receiving baptism. So everything is Son of Mary, Son of Mary. But that Son of Mary is the Son of God. So there was no confusion. This is how they celebrated faith, through chants. There was no doctrinal imposition. And at this moment, I'd like to bring in one Malayalam word. How the Aramaic word, Haimanusa, which we translate into English as faith. The Kerala people, translated into Malayalam or maybe into Tamil before Malayalam became a language. Vishwasa. Vishwasa. Shwasa is breath. Breath. Vishwasa is Vishishtamaya Shwasa. That means it is beautiful breath. This is how they translate faith into Malayalam. It is part of the breath of the people. 
It is not just something that you believe in. It is not something that you discuss. It is not that something that you arrive at a conclusion. But it is your breath, your own breath. <coughs> that idea of breath comes from another word in Aramaic that is the meaning of which is breath is ruha. Ruha, which we translate awkwardly in English as Holy Spirit. Ruha, the very breath of God. Personification is the third person of the breath. So this faith among the Christians in India, St. Thomas Christians, celebrated through their songs and dances, and then continued, and then every love story has a villain, like the Hindi movies, you have seen that. <laughs> that villain came from Portugal. So the missionaries came, they encountered St. Thomas Christians, and they saw that they were worshipping in Syria. Their idea of Catholicism was different from what they saw. They said, we have to change this. We have to change it to the Latin. But St. Thomas Christians said, no. This is the way of Thomas. You follow the way of Peter. And this is the language of Jesus. So we want to retain this language. So what happened, they, they introduced Latin elements, but they translated them into Syria. In the video, we will see examples of that. Well, the villain went away. A little bit of that villain resurfaced in the 1960s. The people, St. Thomas Christians, the Thiravalavar Christians we are talking about, they thought that the language has lost its credibility. Nobody knows Syriac. So they changed, as it happened in the Latin Rite, they changed everything into Malayalam in the 1962. So the generation that was born after the, that transition did not know the language. So slowly the language is on deathbed right now. But it's in this context that I come on the scene. So when I came to New York to do my PhD, I wanted a new topic. I grew up in the tradition. I was an author server reading Syriac in Malayalam script. So when it came to the choice of doctoral dissertation, I chose Syriac chants in South India at the City University of New York. I had a great eminent director, Dr. Stephen Blum. During that, I also worked on a CD of Syriac chants and then the interest came in and it continued. So after, after PhD, I continued research on because if someone didn't do anything, this could die out. So I started the Aramaic project. The result of that project is what you're going to see now. The video has four sections. It's a 22 and a half minute video. It has four sections. One is, why should we take the Aramaic tradition in India seriously? I talk to eminent people, people who know better than I do, and we listen <coughs> to their answers. The second part is how East meets West. How St. Thomas Christians met the Portuguese missionaries and during the interaction, finally the Portuguese missionaries succeeded in convincing the St. Thomas Christians to accept their rituals and practices and translate the chants into Syriac. That gave up a new brand of Syriac music that is exclusively the patrimony of the Sri Malabar Christians in Kerala. The third section of the video is the transmission of this tradition from the older generation to the younger generation. And the fourth is our attempt to reintroduce Syriac into the vernacular literature. Interestingly, I am so happy to stand here and talk about that because the first time we did that in America was not far from here at the Catholic University campus at the National Shrine. We had a celebration, India event, and we celebrated Mass in the Sri Ramalabar tradition. The Cardinal came from India, and we introduced two Sri chants in that liturgy. Young people are catching on, and I'm so happy that we have representatives from uh, Falls Church, Virginia, who just last week, last Saturday, for their first communion, they sang three Great chance, including the one I sang in the beginning. And I thought, wow, for the first communion kids, what else can you say? Three years of catechism, they compressed into two lines. Sagadinba, la la husa, walna chusa, the la pulaga. We, without doubt, we believe in your divinity and humanity. It's not just a piece of bread. 
you are both man and God. In other words, this is becoming part of a miracle. And that's how I'd like to conclude this presentation by talking about some good news, uh, complimenting uh, about two countries. One, my adopted country, America. Second, my native country, India. Once I finished my doctoral dissertation and then I embarked on this RNA project, the first support came from my own parishioners and the local bank, Mass Peripheral Savings Bank. Even though they did not fully understand what exactly I was embarking on, <laughs> they came forward and helped me to launch the project. And then, to my surprise, it caught on. Uh, first example is uh, his father Justin here. Yes. Oh, thank you. That is his parish. I, I thank you for encouraging your children to sing that. We couldn't include that in the video. So it will come because it just happened recently. Priestly ordination that took place a week ago in New Jersey, they sang Sri Chants. <laughs> during a priestly ordination. So it is catching. This is becoming the patrimony of this country. It is becoming America. That's the story of America. It came from everywhere. It found its own life here. So someday it will become part of the Christian experience of the children here. And finally, my native country, India. India from the beginning welcomed ideas, ideologies, and even contradictory ideas in this show. When we think of India, it's a slightly different imagination of the country from the contemporary forces that want to reduce India into a Hindu country, a narrow perspective. But India, in my view, is not a country. It is a concept, a concept of coexistence. India is like the river in Herman Hesse's Siddhartha. Everything that flows into it comes to the shore and becomes Indian. It is fascinating. Open to everybody, welcoming everybody, but converting it into Indian. That nation is philosophy. Let noble thoughts come from anywhere. Serve as a basis for the preservation of the Sadamaic tradition in India. And it survived all this while. And we are now making a historical intervention to make it happen to make it going for the next generation and the generation after. So it is this great nation with its open-mindedness gave it impetus. Therefore, I would like to conclude this presentation by saying, Jai Hind. Thank you.